Hi, I'm Duncan McGregor with Rackspace, and sitting with me here is Joe Armstrong and Robert Verding, uh, from both co-founders of the programming language Erlang. Um, Rackspace uses Erlang for uh, solving its concurrent problems and creating solutions for those problems. And uh, we're here to let folks know more about the programming language uh, and its background, its history, and where it's going. Okay, I'm Joe Armstrong, and I've been programming since 1968. I, I actually started programming Fortran um, with punch cards, and, and you had to take them down to a big room where men in white coats who were very serious put them into a big machine. And, and uh, then I went to college uh, in London and uh, became a physicist, actually. And I have a failed PhD in particle physics, and uh, then I saw the light, uh, got a job as a programmer, moved to Sweden. I worked uh, building satellite ground stations and built software for the first Swedish satellite then. And I built my first programming language then and my first operating system. And then I moved to Stockholm and uh, I got a job at Ericsson, worked at Ericsson for 14 years um, and sort of accidentally did Erlang. You know, there wasn't the intention to do so, I, I think sort of accident really and, and then Ellen got banned and we quit, <laughs> formed a company, <laughs> uh, that got bought up, got fired, um, became a researcher, got a PhD in a completely different subject, uh, computer science, and was there for four years and now I'm back at Ericsson because <laughs> uh, uh, Ellen got unbanned and, and, uh, <laughs> and now we're building products in Ellen. Excellent. Robert. Yeah, hi, I'm Robert Verding. Um, I started programming late, at least compared to Joe. I about 1980. Mm -hmm. I was a physicist before. Yes. Yes. That's we're, 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 we're physicists. We're physicists. We're my background too, actually. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's great. That's uh, yeah, great. And the physics department got a computer. I was postgrad, so I had access to the computer. I did do some work for the department on it, but after a while, the physics department, I decided I should go do something else. So um, I started working for Ericsson. And the small department managing back to VMS computers in the Stockholm area. So that's what we're doing. That came in a lot of time for other things. So I started, literally started hacking, became a hacker. And then um, the Ericsson Computer Science Department and I discovered each other. So I started working for them. That was the right place for me. So I worked there for 15 years. Amongst other things, developing our and doing other projects as well. And then well, I left at the same time with Joe to, to, to Pluto. And we were fired at the same time. <laughs> 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 well, so <laughs> I, I went to Swedish. I went to Swedish military procurement. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. working there with um, modelling simulation and looking at using computer games within the military, mm -hmm. which has now become quite serious, actually. Quite right, serious. Right. And then I started Alan Solutions two years, two and a half years ago, mm -hmm. working there since then, mm -hmm. mainly with training, some consulting as well. Great. So we're all physicists. That's we're right. All, we're all physicists. We're all yeah. physicists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about some the background of the language, mm -hmm. and then we can move into some other topics after that. Yeah. But um, so for those that don't know in the audience, uh, how would you best describe Erlang um, as it appears in one language in the sea of so many programming languages? Well, concurrent. Yeah, concurrent. 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 And functional. Functional. concurrent and functional. Hmm. Okay. Great. I mean, there was a guy at a lecture today who said, if, if Java's um, right wants run anywhere, Erlang's right wants run forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I like that. Yes. Yes. That's okay. good. You know, you press the button, it starts, it runs forever. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. it. That's the goal. That's it. So most software has its inception in address addressing a particular pain point. Mm -hmm. What pain was experienced at, apparently, Ericsson? Uh, errors. Errors. But you're building fault tolerant systems. Okay. I mean, the, yeah. both of us sort of locked into an old tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the tradition was four minutes of downtime per year, duplicated processors, change the code on the fly. So and this was for like old That was systems. from systems that were delivered in about 1972, okay. yeah. 74. And they were programmed in a, in a sort of, one of the first object oriented languages was sort of block recovery, yeah. Plex, yeah. But, but that was becoming old, you know. It was, mm -hmm. uh, it was more or less a sort of real time, how would you call it? Basic with processors, yeah, and hardware protection, and hardware protection, and um, things in it to build robust systems, to build fault tolerant systems, mm -hmm. which, yeah. which was a, is a major criteria. Yeah. And 
that, that was, we had the same type of demand on a new language, which became our language. Right. It had to be concurrent. It had to be fault tolerant. It had to be good fault tolerant systems, otherwise it just wouldn't be interesting. But, but it wasn't, we didn't, it wasn't like we were developing a language. We were just looking at programming in general. How do you program these systems? Right. I mean, it was kind of, you don't really think when you start off that kind of project, hey, we're going to develop a new language that we could use it. You know, it, it, it's, uh, hey, let's, let's solve this problem. You actually used Prolog initially, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Well, lots of things. We tried, what, 18 different languages? Yeah, something. I mean, not 18. I tried Smalltalk and Prolog and mm -hmm. Simple Standard Lisp. Yeah, you tried. Yeah, well, I, I did some Lisp and C. I think I did some Pascal, too. Right. Uh, we, had, we had a small... The lab had a small switch, which we connected to our computer. Uh, actually, it was Ericsson's first Unix machine. Mm. And we basically programmed telepathy with anything that we could get running on that machine. Uh -huh. So that became and BSD. Right, right. Everything. Any, everything and anything. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, you did small talk. I didn't. Yeah, I did I small didn't, talk. Yeah. Yeah. We sort of ended up in Prolog. Mm -hmm. that, that's when we started yeah. discovering we had, had to do our own language. And that was a discovery process. It was a discovery yeah, process. Yeah. Well, well I, I, I like Prolog more than anything else, and I like uh -huh. the message passing from Smalltalk. Uh -huh. So I thought the object model in Smalltalk with message passing is great. Mm -hmm. And Smalltalk's great for the predicate logic, but Smalltalk absolutely lousy error recovery, and it's lou it doesn't have any processes. Mm -hmm. So Smalltalk, mm. small when it fails, just says no. You know, that's it. Right. That's not very good for error recovery. So I just added. Um, Processes to small talk and, and error recovery, and at that and, that, and at that stage, Robert. Yeah. Robert said, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then Robert said, "Can I?" He always starts like this. Can I? Can I? Can I rewrite that a bit? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we alternated, and, and and I think I got my program back. You know, <laughs> none of my code left. Only a few small changes. <laughs> the comment at the start. Joe started writing this, <laughs> and, and, and then he got fed. I, I think we kind of successively got fed up doing it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. After each rewrite, uh, I'd work on it for a couple of weeks, get fed up. Ah, that's it. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you rewrote it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the whole time we're developing, developing our, our ideas mm -hmm. and also our understanding of what the actual problem was, or what, yeah, what the problem was. Yeah. Right. And, and, and what you see today what was that problem. That was that was to build fault tolerant systems. Okay, and by fault tolerant, we mean systems that go forever. Mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, I mean, we, we, we took the view that, that both hardware and software failures are going to occur, and, mm -hmm. and that we, we won't be able to do anything about that. And they are going to occur. So after the event, we have to crack them. Right. And we were building what we knew were going to be massively distributed systems. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the Erlang is kind of interesting today. It's because we were solving those same problems back in the mid '80s. Right. You know, and then, and then, right in the middle of the '90s, then the guys who are building big cloud and things like that, the rack paper people, then realised that heck, actually that's the same as the problem we were looking at in the mid '80s. So that's why we've got a bit of a head start on, on yeah. a lot of other technology. Mm -hmm. okay. And also, the base, one of the basic concepts between the fault tolerance is accepting. Well, as Joe said, accepting the fact that there are going to be errors. Mm -hmm. Things are going to crash in the system. The system as a whole must not crash. Yeah. Right. That, that's the fundamental principle behind the error handling. Okay. The system must not crash. Right. And the, the things will crash in it. Yeah. And there was also a, a kind of philosophical difference in how you handle errors, because everybody else is doing it wrongly, uh -huh. um, because they try <laughs> and handle errors locally. Okay. And, and, and we said you can't handle errors locally, because if the whole machine crashes, how, the, how do you handle the error? Uh -huh. So the, the smallest unit of fault tolerance is two distributed computers. So this guy. That, that performs computation. That guy is, is responsible for error recovery, and they must be on different machines. Mm -hmm. They cannot be on the same machine because if this whole machine crashes, you're lost. Right. And that turns out to be. I didn't realise it at the time. The same thing you need for scalability because once you've done the yeah. architecture yeah. to split it into two things, it's not only fault tolerant; it's also scalable. Right. Well, yeah, because once you've made it work on two, the step of making it work in a three is quite small. Yeah. Once you've yeah. done three, you can four, do four okay. or five. Or so you've got the basic principle. Or a trillion. <laughs> or a trillion. <laughs> or we have got to a trillion. Yet. And that's why it's going to run forever, you see, because once you've, once you've put your software onto a trillion machines, you know, they're not all going to stop. At once. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Not even if the cleaner pulls the plug out of it when it's a vacuum. And, and, and the other thing, which is perhaps less obvious, is because, because now your solution has got two machines, 
it's naturally concurrent and it's naturally distributed. Now suppose you want to build fault tolerant software. You need to learn about concurrency, you need to learn about parallelism, you need to learn about distributed programming. And that's not because you wanted to, it's you must. Yeah. Right. So a lot of the, yeah, so a lot of the features of the language came about because that's the way we decided to solve the problem. Uh -huh. So the problem was there, so how do how do we solve it? So so you need concurrency. Because this problem mm. is very concurrent. Mm -hmm. You need the fault tolerance. You need the error handling so you can build the fault tolerance system. You need the distribution to build even more fault tolerance systems. You need things like co-loading co because you can't take the system down right. through those changes. And there was, it wasn't what we'd planned. It, it, it was sort of the, the requirements. Mm. And also we, we discovered we could not, we couldn't find any other language or system that had these features. Mm -hmm. That's why we ended up doing our own because th there was nothing else. So in, in the process of all of this discovery, uh, what was your favorite part? Was your favorite part uncovering uh, these Sorry. new? What was, the what was your favorite part? What was your favorite part of the entire process? I, uh, actually, I, I think it was when, I always thought it was great fun getting users, you know, Sheshkin and yeah. the gang, that, because that was, that was what made the difference, you see, because up to that point, it was just an experiment. Uh -huh. and, and I don't want to write software that nobody uses. Right. It's just a waste of time. Uh, and, and, and users provide feedback, uh -huh. and, and they allow you to test your ideas, because that's, you know, the, the, the bullet stops if, if yeah. with the application. Mm -hmm. And so we got the users, and that, that was, we, we were kind of generating ideas, yeah. and trying them out, and pushing them out to the users. And we had to, it was rather like the early days of Unix, when what was kept in Unix was what was used, because you didn't have big resources, and yeah. more or less like yeah. Alan, we put stuff into the language, tried it out. If they didn't use it, we took it, we pulled it out again. Right. So what you see today, the link mechanism and things like that, we must have tried 20 or 30 lots different mechanisms. Lots, lots of stuff to do lots that. Of things. Other communication mechanisms. Yeah. Do you remember pipes? Yes, I remember pipes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big comp, it was Muff a pipe, pipe, I remember. Yeah, Muff pipe, pipe yeah. and the it pipe it algebra. And it, was our, it was our solution. Don't see any of that today. <laughs> it was our solution to, to a problem we thought they had. Mm, but uh -huh. they didn't have, have that problem. So, <laughs> so we decided, we invented all this great concept of pipes. Mm. We gave it to them and said, came back and said, did you like it? And they said, we couldn't use it. Uh -huh. <laughs> we took it out. And uh -huh. the reason, of course, was we had just misinterpreted what the problem was. I see. And yeah. that happened a number of times. And uh -huh. then we did pragmatic things. We'd, yeah. we'd, we'd do an optimization to write a heck of a lot of code yeah. and find it's only 2% better, but it's yeah. more complicated, right. yes. so we'll check yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and the, in the end, the end is everything that's in our mm -hmm. in the system, and the system design is there because someone actually wanted it. It's actually being used. Mm -hmm. And we got rid of stuff. Apart from priorities. Apart from priorities. And well, macros. there, but and macros. Well, macros people use. Yeah, well, they should. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Where's the camera? Do yeah. not use macros. <laughs> <laughs> actually, along the way, we got we got rid of a lot of stuff that uh -huh. just failed or wasn't wasn't ne needed. So we just got rid of it. And one of the things we found was that our, our, our attempts at making solutions were usually wrong. Uh -huh. So it's better to provide the tools and let the people writing the application mm -hmm. build their own mechanisms on top. Right, right. I mean, that's the joy of the conference. We, you go there, we, yeah. we built the basic infrastructures and, and, and then sort of, let's see what guys can do with it. And they come yeah. back with all fantastic applications. Yeah, so it's yeah. really uh, amazing. Uh, so most of the applications people do today are things we mm -hmm. never dreamed of mm -hmm. uh -huh. doing. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, really, that's really fun. Yeah, that is. I saw a couple of really great presentations yesterday yeah. that yeah, yeah, completely yeah. blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, those visualizations of parallel processes. That, right. that was fantastic. wonderful. That was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. That's and just the other things, all the products people build with it. Yeah. yeah. Just surprised every time. Say, wow. <laughs> How'd they come up with that <laughs> idea at all? That's <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> and then it's, it's kind of their surprise that it was so easy. Uh -huh. And they come to us like, oh, we built this system. And it's just as easy. And we go, yeah, well, yeah, well, we knew it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we made it for. That's what we yeah. made it for. Yeah. yeah. And so then the reason it's easy for them is because they're a tackling problems that were like the problems it was designed to tackle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's yeah. not surprising that it's yeah. easy. Yeah. This is a nice segue into the next section, which is the relevance of Erlang uh, in, in today's world. Um, and we touched on this a little bit in the introduction, but tell us what you feel the key strengths of the language are. Concurrency and fault tolerance. <laughs> yeah. Literally, yeah, literally. I, uh -huh. I, I mean, mm. I know we talk, we used to talk a lot about the function, functional side yeah. of it, and that, that's, that's good. 
and it, it enables other things, but I'd say the concurrency and, and the fault tolerance mechanism. Yeah. Right, with, with languages like Closure and whatnot. Well, I, think, I mean, we, we saw that in some of the talks, that the right. guys building big data centers um, are just buying new hardware, mm -hmm. and the, you know, the, yeah. the guy's saying, well, we, we've got the, the latest hardware, 24 CPUs on, on the cards, uh, and then they got the idea of measuring the utilization, mm -hmm. and they find, hey, only one CPU is doing anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's because they haven't sold the concurrency. No. So, so the whole industry is doing the wrong thing about... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are, because you've got... Yeah. You've got, you've got the problem that everybody else, apart from the Erlang people, are solving is we've got this legacy code written in a sequential language. How do we parallelize it? Mm -hmm. So you've got C++, yeah. Java, what the heck? It's sequential. Mm -hmm. You've got a parallel machine. How do you parallelize it? Mm -hmm. And they think that problem can be solved. Well, I, as a computer scientist, know people have been trying to solve that problem since about 1965. And they, they, well. Yeah, and they think they can automate it. Mm -hmm. right? And nobody has ever managed to automate it for despite... 35, 40 not years of research. Not in the general case. I mean, we don't do that. Right. You see, we, there's a, the, the bitter pill camera, bitter pill. <laughs> if you want to parallelize stuff, you've got to throw away all your old software and write it in a parallel language. And they think that's going to be very difficult. Uh -huh. and the reason it's not difficult is because when they do a parallel application in a sequential language, you get all this artificial complexity. Mm -hmm. and, and their applications are 85% artificial complexity. They're reinventing Erlang. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do that. To do it. Right. Well, yeah, because as soon as you're going to start doing parallel systems, you have to have, have to put parallelism, parallelism into it. How am I going to communicate? Mm. How am I going to synchronize? How am I going to share resources? You have all these problems you have to tackle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to solve them. And that's one of the, there are a bunch of things that Alan provides for you, mm. these mechanisms right. for doing that. And if you don't take it from the system you're building on top, you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, in one sense, the ideas are simple. In other sense, getting a good implementation of them is difficult. Right. So, I mean, if you look at the implementation of the, of, of the Alling system, there's a lot of effort being put in to make this go fast, to make it go very well, to make it secure. And if you do it yourself, you have to do all that yourself. Mm. It's difficult. Yeah. That I mean, it took us, t I mean, there must be hundreds of man years of work yeah. In, in, yeah. in the virtual machine. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, they can the machine. a group of 15 yeah. people working on it over 15 years, yeah. you know, 200 right. man years work. Yeah. So it's, it's actually pretty difficult. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're continually optimizing the system. Yeah. Every, every version, they got rid of locks to make it go just a little bit better on a bit more concurrent and more parallel systems. So, so what everybody else is doing is they're trying to parallelize legacy code, mm -hmm. yeah. turn sequential code into parallel code. We're doing something completely different. We've already got all our parallel code. When we put it on this 24-core machine, then maybe it doesn't go 24 times faster. Ooh, dear. And we think, why isn't it going 24 times faster? It should go 24 times faster. So what we're seeing now are the tools which are finding the little bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. And when we pull those bottlenecks out, then it maybe will go 24 times faster. So we're doing a completely different problem. Right. We're saying it is parallel, uh -huh. yeah. but it's not completely parallel because we've got these sequential bits here. So how can we find them? Right. So we're tackling a completely different problem. We've and that's solved the problem that the industry should right. tackle. Right, right. Yeah. Because if you're, you're in a rack space, how many CPUs? Have you measured the utilization of your CPUs on a board? <laughs> <laughs> Go measure. Because no, no. no, yeah. you invest in all these things. Uh -huh. Maybe you've got 20 cores on a board. And if you measure and you find you've only got one CPU doing anything, then you might as well get much cheaper boards and throw them away. Right. Or instead of new investments, you might find out why you can't run anything on the 20. Uh -huh. Go do it. Yeah, it's, all, it's all this, again. Amdahl's law, right. which says how depressingly, <laughs> 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 how depressing, how the little parallelisms you can get as soon as you start getting sequential software yeah. code. Uh -huh. So I mean, if you've got a five percent, if you five percent of your system is six sequential, which is very small actually, mm. right. you will not get more than twenty times speed no. up. No matter, even if you've got an infinite number of processors, you will still no. just not get faster. Because five percent on one machine, mm. always, right. yeah. and that's that's very depressing. But it, it also, then, then you get back to the problem, yes, I've got my parallel system, but I still have to write my application in such a way to use parallelism. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, our language is easier because it was designed for doing that process from the very beginning. Right. You still have to write your application in a way to do it. I mean, it's very easy, like, like we saw mm -hmm. in the presentation yeah. yesterday. It's very easy to get, to, um, get sequential blocks in the system, or blocking process and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But you can see them and you can get around them if you know what you know about them. Right, right. And, and actually, the, 
as the number of cores goes up, the problem gets worse because because if you have got a lock, a sequential global lock, mm -hmm. you know when you had a dual core and the lock goes, you stop the two processes at the same time. But if you've got a thousand CPUs yeah. right. and you take a lock, you stop a thousand processes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yes. You, know. so so you want to get rid of these locks and things. Uh, uh, yeah. that, that in a sense, why we see in one one way, our link is becoming more relevant uh -huh. today because uh -huh. the, the problem is not get going away by itself; it's actually getting worse. Uh -huh. It's a bigger problem in a 24-core machine than it was in a 16-core yeah. machine. When I get a and they drop the clock rate as well. Right. When I get a 100-core machine or a 1,000-core machine, it's going to be even worse. Mm -hmm. right. And do you find that this is one of the reasons that so many people are coming to the community, um, becoming airline developers? I, I, I think, I think, a lot I think it's a mixture. Of yeah. the it's the success stories and the... Uh, yeah, a, a, a lot. I mean, and the, the, the number of sort of typical, it's a typical case of where airline just works very well. Uh -huh. You're building yeah. a server, you want to handle lots of multiple con connections, Alan just fits like that perfectly into that. Right. And in that sense, they probably they might be more interested in just that they, ha they have that problem mm -hmm. that they see the solution rather than maybe a, from a philosophical view. I mm -hmm. see. Very practical approach. It's a very practical yeah, yeah. approach, yeah. I mean, our development language was extremely practical. It, it, we did, it didn't become functional because we wanted to do a functional language. Right. It became functional because that's where it ended up and that seemed like the best, <laughs> best way to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. Eliminate the side effects. Yeah, yeah, eliminate side effects, then you make concurrency mm. and fault tolerance much easier. Mm. Now the garbage collector becomes much easier. Because uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there are no backward loops in it. In yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we ended up there because that seemed the best. Now that's why I think things like closure are interesting. Mm -hmm. Because Rich is, is attacking the same type of problems. Mm -hmm. he, he has this mm. concurrency. <laughs> okay, he's got a different base on it. He's got the same problem concurrency. How are you going to interact with systems? Um, how are you going to uh, handle interactions? Right. He does it a different way, mm -hmm. but I mean, he's exact attacking exactly the same mm -hmm. problems. Right. And you've got Acker on Scala, which are also mm -hmm. attacking exactly the same problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're at least honest enough to say that they've got a lot of ideas from us. <laughs> <laughs> and OTP, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it these days. <laughs> Speaking of ideas from Erlang, what about Go? Have a, you know, Google backs Go. It's getting a lot of popular mm -hmm. press these days. It's got a concurrent answer. Yeah. It's, from what I see, it's a nice language. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I've uh, looked a bit. It it's got a very good heritage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. good track record. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem to handle error handling, yeah. although I might have missed that. Mm. It doesn't do code related ones. In, no. in the sense no. of like fault tolerant systems, fault like you're building really okay. fault tolerant okay. systems. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you get an error, what happens? How much crashes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and have you you will get an error. Yeah. Right. Just accept. And it, doesn't, it doesn't have these kind of pattern matching and higher order functions and things. Yeah. And they, I, I mean, the, I the pattern matching just really means your yeah. code volume goes down. It's beautiful. Yeah. Pattern matching yeah. is one of the so best yeah. features. I mean, that's why your programs are short because of the pattern matching. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But I think, th again, they're, they're, they're seeing the problem. Uh -huh. They have this concurrency, this parallelism problem, and they're, they're, they're attacking that problem. And I'll say, okay, they come from a more sea like mm. um, heritage, so to speak. That's in there, but uh, again, it's the, they're just attacking the same type of problem, and mm -hmm. this is where everything's going to go eventually. It has right. to. Right. Uh, well, that's that's a great lead-in actually, because yeah. the next section we want to talk about is distributed systems, yeah. the cloud, and the future of computing. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> who knows? <laughs> the, the future, of I'd say, the future of computing definitely is parallelism. Uh -huh. I mean, if you go out and buy a machine now, and it's still the same. It's the same number of gigahertz on my PC now as it was for 10, 15 years ago. Right. But now I've got more cores on it. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But you see the clock rate's going down. The clock rate's actually going down sometimes. Uh, it's going down. Uh -huh. So I mean, you ask us, we would we would like a lot of very simple slow cores, because we know the program. Yeah, we can and we it would go a lot faster. We can spread the system out. And and then 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 there's gonna be some new problems coming up. Uh -huh. So so uh, things like sort of load unbalancing mm -hmm. because I mean, <laughs> well, the thing that everybody's doing wrong is load balancing. Because if you if you you got all your servers like that, you've got to load balance them. What do you do? You choose the least loaded server and you send the stuff to the least loaded server. Uh -huh. That means you can't turn that off. And when you want to save energy, uh -huh. you want to concentrate the load yeah. so that you can turn the whole uh -huh. thing off. So you want load unbalancing, and we need algorithms for load unbalancing. And uh, interesting. And we need. Uh, there are certain basic assumptions in Erlang that we need to look at again because yep. they turn out not to be true. Um, yeah. So, so, for example, in an airline system, we've sort of assumed that the, me the time to pass a message between any pair of processes is constant. It's got nothing to do with the physical architecture. Mm -hmm. When you put it on a 
when you do distributed Erlang on a massive multi-core, uh, it might passing messages between two processes on the same core is pretty quick, right. but it's not a constant between between the process on different pairs of, mm -hmm. of cores. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I measured once a 60 time variation between sort of two cores because I've got to go through two levels of caches. On the same machine? On the same machine. Right. You're getting new, you're so I've got two cores, architect. two cores like right. one there and one there, it takes mm -hmm. 60 times longer than that one next to it. Yeah. Right. right. And, and so I think we need to understand that. But that's research. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's research. But you see, we can do that research. Now, when the C++ guys have figured out how to parallelize their things, which will take them 15 years, then <laughs> they can start doing the problems we're trying to do now. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't want to be nasty about C++ in particular. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, C++ is, I mean, it's quite it's, good. It's it, it, really fast and it's much better. It's much, if you want to do cryptography, Oh, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. image compression or something. Do it in C++. Mm -hmm. But if you want to coordinate it in a distributed system, do it in Erlang. Right. So, I mean, Erlang's not the universal panacea. Right. And if you want to do number crunching, yeah, do it in C. Fortran is Fortran. still better. Fortran is still, I think Fortran is still probably the fastest thing to do number crunching, still today. Hmm. FPGA is easy. Well, yeah, but that's not a program. GPU. Yeah, GPU is, but you can probably <laughs> program it with Fortran as well. So, if you want to do number, so, so I mean, one of the things we, we've ad advocated Almost since the beginning. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's camera is pretty yeah. good. But it's not Erlang anyway. You wouldn't do number crunching, no. serious no. number crunching no. in Erlang. You just wouldn't do it. No. And, and but, but, well, you should. You should. Yeah, you could. You can. <laughs> you can, yes, you can. of course. Can. You can. Can. Say, tomorrow, we is weather, tomorrow is weather the next month, right? <laughs> Actually, certain things you should do. For example, you've got big nums. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and they, some, a lot of algorithms have become very, very simple with big nums. Yeah. So you do cryptography with big nums. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. But I mean, we've ad advocated so almost since the beginning that um, use different languages yes. in your system, yes. different ideas in system for doing different things. Yes. So Erlang's great for some things, right. say high level logic coordination, um, just monitoring and control. Mm -hmm. If you want to do number crunching, no. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, if you want to do um, other handling data, mm -hmm. C. DSP, FPGA, yeah, or something. Yeah, and and then, you just, then you just manage those from the Erlang system. It's great. Set up the connections, set everything going from Erlang, keep things running, and do, use something much better for doing the actual data processing. And can you still use like the Erlang supervisor to yeah. overdrive? Yeah, absolutely. Well. Yes, yes, yeah. Fantastic. Then, then, you use this, then you've got the Erlang system. You put a little layer in between. Mm -hmm. The Erlang yeah. system yeah. Is manages the connection. Uh -huh. and if the connection goes down, of course, you have to decide what to take, kill the Erlang process, maybe restart or take the connection down or whatever. Right, right. The best is, I still, in that way, I still these um, the Dutch guy doing the great astrophysics. I didn't see that. Uh, that was last. It was last time. Oh, uh, you, you have the problem uh, um, in astrophysics. Well, radio astronomy is extremely big problem. Um, you, to build very big, you need to build very big telescopes because you get low resolution, mm -hmm. and then then you need to. You can't build very big telescopes, so you have to have, to have a bunch of telescopes working together. Right. And the biggest diameter you can get is the biggest diameter of the Earth, so you right. have telescopes in different countries. Uh -huh. And they're all sending in their data, and you want, to, want them to get them to work together, so you have to correlate this data. And it's just a vast, enormous amount of data coming in, I think there are, I don't know how many gigabits. So I plan to build boards that could handle 16 gigabits of data per board or something like this. Uh -huh. And of course you can't do that in Erlang, but they found Erlang was very nice to manage that system. Uh -huh. And then they were mm. doing yeah, specialized yeah. hardware for, for the data processing itself. Yeah. Right. But managing it out. Yeah, I mean, it's a perfect yeah. use. That's a perfect use, yeah. Uh -huh. Nice. And yeah. In, in a sense, it's the same use that we do in Ericsson. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when we build a switch, uh, we, we divide. I mean, this is folklore of how you build stuff. We, we, we have what's called the control plane and the data plane. Mm -hmm. And the control plane and data plane software is very different. In the data plane, it's FPGAs, special purpose hardware, VLSI, and it's programmed in C or assembler, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's very specific number crunching algorithms. Then the control plane, it's ASN1 protocols, it's enormous protocols, cubic mm -hmm. miles of documentation. Mm -hmm. this, this stuff doesn't have to execute particularly quickly, but it's very, very complicated. Right. This stuff has to execute extremely quickly, it's rather simple. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's an interface between them. And that's exactly, this is what the, yeah, radio it's it's the exactly or what any control system is doing. Yeah. The, the high level decisions yeah. are appropriate to describe in high level language, and the low level stuff is yeah. appropriate to describe in software. Right. Uh, sorry, oh, hardware. Great job. Yeah. 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 And then you just interface the two. Yeah. Yeah. So we're up in this top bit, we, we make no claims to the bottom bit. Uh -huh. 
If anyone does claim they have any food for that, they're yeah, wrong. They're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of talk about cloud computing these days. Yeah. Java's got several, Eucalyptus, mm -hmm. CloudStack, yeah. Python's got OpenStack. Um, is there any talk or interest in the cloud for an airline? Yes, naturally. I mean, at our own solutions, we're building stuff to do that. Uh -huh. It's not a product yet, but it's, we're, we're working on that. It's exciting. And again, I mean, if the problem's there, so we have to attack it in some way. Nice. And we can use. A lot of clouds are, I think, what's it, cloud I, I, I'm not I really good on this I stuff, know. but right, right, uh, yeah. I mean, there are, you know, the clouds can mean two things. I mean, they, they can mean in the sense, okay, we've got an SQL database in the, in the cloud mm -hmm. and we provide this service, or it's how you implement that. So, so I think we're, I mean, we're inside GitHub implementing mm -hmm. the GitHub stuff and, right. uh, and doing that. So are we in the cloud or not? I don't know, but we implement GitHub. So. Right. <laughs> and uh, again, the cloud gives you many, the same, GitHub, ma many the cloud gives you many of the same type of problems, right? Uh -huh. You have distribution. Uh -huh. I mean, that's part, of, that's part of the problem, right? Right. or part of the solution, right? So the cloud provides you solutions. You have, you have to fit your problem into that. Uh -huh. And part of it is, if I've got access to many machines, how am I going to build my system to use all those machines? Right. And then, then suddenly, I can't have a single thread because then I'm just mm -hmm. wasting more. Right? Yeah. So concurrency. So so what, what, what we'd like to hope, if, if you're going to build a cloud from scratch and you take the Erlang OTP system, that hopefully about 85% of your problem is already solved, and mm -hmm. you've got to do the the application specific bit, the 15% bit. And if you start with non Erlang, you've got to do all this 85. But you, the trouble is, you don't realise you've got to do that 85. <laughs> but you haven't done it before. <laughs> you might be slightly over optimistic. What 85%? <laughs> But we'll never well, okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but <laughs> Yes, but the idea is Yeah, yes. but I mean, a, a high proportion of the yeah. system. You, you have all these problems, which are just another, exactly the same type of problems we were attacking, just from a different mm. different level. A right. long time ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And exactly the same thing is, ha is going from it's one cause to multiple. <laughs> have to come from somewhere. Yeah. Going from one cause to multiple cause, or going from one machine to a thousand machines. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's a similar type of problem you do, it's a similar type of structuring up of your application. How do I do it? How do I get things to communicate with each other? Right. How do I keep track of it that the other machine is actually still there and hasn't gone down or lost communication with it? Which I know you shouldn't, but it shouldn't happen, but it does. So. Right. Yeah. And so is that where you see Erlang going in the future? 1,000 cores, 10,000 yeah, cores? Yeah, I mean, there are research cores. projects in Actual the European research, Union. Like yeah, I mean, they're, they're looking at the million core problem in a yeah, phenomenal. European yeah. Union research project. Yeah, I think we're you're involved in that, aren't you? I think we're involved, actually. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, Eric, yeah Ericsson yes. and Alan Solutions yes. involved. A number of universities and a mm -hmm. number of other companies yeah, as well. So I think we're looking at a thousand cores at the moment. Because that's what, that's what we, we haven't got a billion cores here. Yeah, because so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we can get our hands on at the moment to test. But there is an explicit goal for the million yeah. core problem? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Nice. there is. I mean, it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, even with something like a thousand cores, you're seeing all these problems we mentioned before. It's, they're not equal in communicating yeah, between them. Very different. Different. So you get, groups of, you get groups of cores that work together. Yeah, and how do I solve that? It's going to be problem? quite fun. Right, right. Uh -huh. no, we'll see what happens. And what happens when you go from a thousand cores to a thousand machines? What, what does that mean? Because right. we're already seeing um, Alan, Alan Kay's object oriented programming, you know, send a message to an object to get it to do something and send a reply yeah. back. And he said, this was the basis for that was, was biology, the cells. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and Alan Kay said um, that this was also the basis of, of sort of error recovery systems. I mean, what, what you see when you make this transition from a few thousand, I mean, if you're an expert, you can, you can manage a thousand systems or something like that. But when, you, when you've got a quarter of a million systems, the, the notion of managing them becomes silly. They have to self-prepare. They have to self-configure. They have to be autonomous. Right, yeah. So, and, and that's when we've got millions of cores or trillions of cores and God knows how many computers. <laughs> right. <laughs> trillion I mean, I, 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 <laughs> well, no, that would be a few years, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, they you know, they're, they're shrink yeah, down yeah. and down. Then I mean, we'll yeah. throw the laptop away in ten years' time yeah, and have a yeah. pair of glasses, yeah. and then we'll throw that away and you just yeah. spray it on your body. <laughs> or something. And then you just take a blue pill. <laughs> there you are. We've got a, we've yeah. got a cray one in a, in, a, in your tooth or something. You know. Well, I mean, even today, if you've got one of these really big parallel machines, you have to put a lot of effort in, into adjusting your application to fit into it. Mm -hmm. And some of some applications it fits, some some don't. Uh, right. you, you had the problem. Today. I mean, I think it's quite funny because um, if you look at the time perspective that Erlang was developed, it started in '86, uh, and and people seem they say, well, can you can you run Erlang on a mobile phone, right? So there's Erlang for Android, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah, came out two three months ago, and and 
people sort of think that a mobile phone is a weak device and think you couldn't run Erlang on it, it won't be powerful enough to run, to run it on that. And then, and then I have to think, wait a moment, that mobile phone is about a million times more powerful than the machine we developed Erlang on. And I was joking, I, I said this at a talk and I said it's more powerful than Cray 1 was, which was a supercomputer. And then, and then somebody said, no, he wasn't joking, yes, he was joking. And they looked it up and it, my mobile phone was more powerful than a Cray 1. My, that <laughs> mobile phone was had, over there. You had, you had more power in your mobile yeah. phone that was used to land um, Apollo on the moon. Yeah, like a Z80, right? Yeah. So yeah. when you think that the mobile phone I've got now is a million times more powerful than the computer we developed Erlang on, right. then, then it, the question, can you run Erlang on a mobile phone in these small devices, is ridiculous, because of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, our original VAX, it had a whopping great 8 megabytes of memory. There was the big memory one. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, I think, and I think it had about 8 <coughs> megahertz processor yeah, or yeah. something like uh -huh. this. I think we had about a 250 me uh, megabyte disk. Right. That, that's what you actually had a disc. We, yeah, yeah, we had a hard disc. Yeah. Nice. It was about the size Cost of a, a fortune. dishwasher. Yeah, but <laughs> the whole box was that size of a dishwasher to put in. But so it was, a, in that sense, well, in those days it was a medium sized MIDI uh -huh. machine. Uh -huh. But today, my phone, yes, nothing. I can <laughs> <laughs> okay, run anything this, on my this, phone. This the magic number was 1.44 megabytes because that was a floppy disk. Right. Yeah. So Erlang fitted on a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk. Linux fitted on a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk. And, and it persisted for a very long time. That barrier went to that and then it stuck there for 15 years and then, mm. then it broke. Mm -hmm. And then Apple said, oh, we don't need floppy disks in computers. Everybody, you're mad, you're mad, you're mad, you're mad, you're mad. Where's the floppy disk? Yeah. So now you get a gigabyte. I mean, that's what, 800 times, 600, yeah. 700 times more than, than, than this. You get <laughs> that in your cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember buying games. Oh, you're eating your cornflakes. Like <coughs> what was that? Oh, it's a, flo it's a gigabyte USB memory with some advertising on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still remember buying games with 30 floppies and sort of feeding, <laughs> loading them into the machine and feeding them in, taking about a couple of hours to load the thing in. <laughs> and then when you've got these things in there, you, you've got this, you've got like a gigabyte software thing in it, and it says, please back up, your, you know, because please back up your software before installing this, you know, you think, oh, 6,000 floppy disks or something, <laughs> <laughs> what are you supposed to do? Well, I mean, now, now you get, what, 32, 32 gigabyte USB stick, yeah. which is about the size of your nail, mm -hmm. and they actually have to make it bigger so you can put yeah. the handle on to get out the machine. And then you've got Dropbox or something, mm -hmm. yeah, send yes, it up there. Yes, that's so it's radically changed. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it's going to change again. Right. We're well, going to see these scale going. changes. It's uh, just going to keep on going. Yeah. And it sounds like the research is being done right now to keep Erlang right at the forefront of that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean. And, and uh, it, Moore's law is giving you like a factor of a thousand every 10 years. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, and that's a scale change. A factor, mm -hmm. factor of two, three doesn't change the game, but a mm -hmm. factor of a thousand does. Mm -hmm. So what you saw the scale change in memory, the first scale change in memory. Um, caused digital music and digital photography. Mm -hmm. Because a, 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 an MP3 file is about a, a megabyte per minute. Mm -hmm. So it attracts five megabytes. Mm -hmm. And digital image is about 200 kilobytes. So if you have, you want to suppose you want a music player on a device. Well, when the device had 20 megabytes of memory, mm -hmm. <laughs> You, four, got, you got four, four songs four on it, yeah, no, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and the CPU couldn't keep up because the CPU at those times four four megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So make a scale change both uh, in CPU. For, you go from four megahertz to well, not four gigahertz. You go from four megahertz to say a gig, yeah. eight hundred megahertz. You go from four megabytes of memory to four gigabytes. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you've enabled digital music. You've enabled digital photography. Yeah. Right. All and the then, markets emerge. Yeah. yeah, and then when you make the next scale change up to a terabyte. Mm -hmm. uh, then what was true for music becomes true for films. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, we're almost there now. Yeah, and, and, at, at, and then some interesting things start happening at about 250 terabytes, mm -hmm. uh, because then we can store all, I mean, the Google scan all books, that takes about, will take, when it's all done, about 250 terabytes of store. Mm -hmm. And with a, with a scale change in the technology, that will mean that the USB memory of the future, you can have not one e-book, but all e-books. <laughs> <laughs> All human knowledge. Mm. Uh -huh. This is fantastic. Is, yes. And then we'll see another scale change. And what? what and and Whoa. what's going to happen? Nobody's <laughs> got a clue. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, that's about so as far, far as you, th you, exactly. can predict, you can predict that far, because yeah. then, then you yeah. can sort of look at what's going I think we can predict the scale changes, but we can't predict what will happen because of them. So so. Leave that to Charlie Strauss. Yeah, the next scale change. What, yeah. what happens when, when everyone's got terabytes of yeah. memory well, on their phone? Right? Yeah. So, so a friend of mine who's doing research in big database says uh, the 
a scan of the human genome is about 600 terabytes or something. Okay. Or, and, um, or was it 600 gigabytes? I can't remember. No, I think it's 600 gigabytes. I think it's 600 gigabytes. Yeah, 600 gigabytes. gigabytes. Yeah. And, and you can scan off it. You can you could be able to buy a genome scanner for about three or four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's perfectly feasible to today uh, to sort of go, you know, get one of these scanners. I don't know what you do, spit into it or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you do. Yeah, and, and, and they go, yeah. brr, 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 and out comes 600 gigabytes of your genome. <laughs> you know, they carry around your pocket and, and take it to the doctor. And, and now it's like, mm, like excuse me, doctor, when am I going to die? And like, well, when you're 62 and a half. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. Right. Right. Yeah. And then we, I think we're going to see these applications, like computationally expensive things. Mm -hmm. Voice recognition, decent voice recognition, yeah. speech, mm -hmm. decent bit things of bloop, speech synthesis. Mm -hmm. Need a lot of computer power. Right. So then we'll see them coming into commodity devices. The speech recognition is very primitive to date. Yeah. It's not as good as we are. Mm. And then you'll have real time. Well, you know, science fiction, you have a little thing in your ear and, and I talk Swedish and you understand it. Mm -hmm. That's only, that Bevel. doesn't need many scale changes. That needs one scale change. The Bevel fish. Yeah, that's about one scale change. Uh -huh. So that's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. In your lifetime, perhaps yeah. not my lifetime, but uh, yes, it w and after that, I don't. Well, think no, it probably will, because it's a scale change takes ten years, right? There you go. Yeah, you'll be around. And yeah. life expectancy is increasing sort of faster <laughs> than <laughs> <laughs> so I live forever. <laughs> yeah, and I think after, that, yeah, I don't think you can predict after. It. Yes, it's going to become more. You can mm -hmm. say that, but what that's going to mean, I don't think you can predict. Right. And hopefully, maybe not Alan, but so something like Alan. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. we we will be very pleased if it's improved. Future yeah. languages. Yeah. We're still quite happy about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Even well, if it's not the language that. Yes, it has already. It has already, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Um, we think. <laughs> well, 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 we, we know. We know, know it has influenced some languages. Because they're stealing our ideas. Yeah. But some of them are saying it, so don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we're still the best. Original and best. Absolutely. Original and yes, best. Yes. Like that, so. yeah. Or the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, the, or the fake. <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today and speaking with us mm -hmm. about past, present, well, and thank future. You for thank, you. Us. Yep. thank you. And thank you all. And come visit us next time. Mm -hmm.